Uh, in my view, uh, we are going to be discussing what I think is the most profound uh, moral issue uh, facing our nation, in fact, facing the world. Uh, and in addition to the folks who will be speaking, and I'll introduce them in a moment, I just want to thank all of the other organizations that are here. I don't know that I know them all. I know the Sisters of Mercy are here, the Vermont Ecumenical Council, and other groups are here. And I very much appreciate not only you being here today, but the work uh, you are doing 365 days a year on this issue. Uh, here is the basic facts. The United States is the wealthiest nation on earth, yet there are more of our people living in poverty today than at any time in the history of the country. For all intent and purposes, the middle class, the great middle class of this country is disappearing, and yet we have more income and wealth inequality in America today than in any time since the 1920s, and the situation in terms of inequality is worse than any other major country on earth. Today, the top 1% owns 38% of the financial wealth of America. The bottom 60% owns all of 2.3% of that wealth. Today, one family, one family, the Walton family, owns more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people, one family. Last year, the top in terms of income, wealth is what we accumulate, in terms of income, in the last several years, 95% of all new income generated goes to the top 1%, while at the same time, tens of millions of people see their standard of living decline. Last year, just as an example, the top 25 hedge fund managers made more than $24 billion. 25 hedge fund managers made more than $24 billion. That is enough to pay the salaries of more than 425,000 public school teachers. So what we are seeing is a huge increase in the number of millionaires and billionaires. Middle class is declining more people living in poverty than any time in our history, and we have the dubious distinction of having by far the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. That's the future of America, 22% of our kids living in poverty. This is a profound moral issue in asking what kind of nation we want to be living in. It is an economic issue in the sense that if so many people have so little they can't spend money and can't create jobs because most jobs are created by consumer spending. And in my view, and I speak only for myself here, it is a political issue because when you have a handful of billionaires with huge amounts of money, they are now using that money politically to further their own goals. So it becomes a profound moral issue, it is an economic issue, it is a political issue. Now, having said that, let me just thank again uh, the folks who are in this room for stressing the moral component of this issue. And I want to introduce uh, Bishop Thomas uh, Ely of the Episcopal, Epis Episcopal, Episcopal Diocese of Vermont. Uh, the Reverend Lynn Buniak is the Conference Minister of the United Church of Christ in Vermont. Monsignor Roland Rivard, uh, who for many years served as pastor at the Christ the King in St. Anthony Parish is with us. He will not be speaking, but we appreciate his being here. And Rabbi Joshua Chasen, who is the senior rabbi at Ohavi Zedek, uh, is here with us as well. Uh, so why don't uh, we begin with Bishop Ely, and we thank you very much, Bishop, for being with us. Thank you, Senator Sanders. And thank you for your advocacy on so many important issues facing our country and our world today and your leadership in the area of economic justice and income inequality. I'm so glad to add my voice to yours and to these distinguished colleagues uh, as we uh, try to provide some important moral leadership and direction for our Vermont faith communities. The President has called income disparity the defining challenge of our time. He speaks an important truth to us 
economic justice and income inequality are indeed moral issues of immediate and urgent concern, and they present us with important choices to make about how we will live and how we will act. Many years ago, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis declared, we may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. Mm. Evidence suggests that inequality is not only corroding our political system, but eroding social cohesion as well. The systemic undermining of the middle class has had serious consequences for the preservation of families, health, education, and employment, and even greater consequences for those at the bottom 30%. Social unrest is a growing possibility in our country. Our financial system has become deeply distorted. Financial institutions that are too big to fail, investments, investment instruments that few can understand, pervasive conflicts of interest that are threatening the ongoing ecological stability of our world, all these contribute to this reality. The suffering and overpowered majority will continue to lose the struggle for jobs, affordable housing, education, retirement security, and a sustainable environment. If we keep silent, these things will happen. The situation cries out for us to open our ears, our eyes, our minds, our hearts to this growing bitter reality. The excesses of the sin of avarice, of greed, along with the sin of pride, are at work in our midst and they have the potential to destroy that which we cherish so much. These are critical ethical issues, touching on our obligations to each other as human beings and therefore central to our faith traditions. We as faith community leaders have a responsibility to provide leadership on these moral issues which have such a direct impact on so many of our fellow Vermonters. The people of the Episcopal Church in Vermont have called upon our presiding bishop, the Most Reverend Catherine Jefferts Shorey, to convene a nationwide interfaith coalition to provide moral leadership for the establishment of economic justice in our country. We have also adopted a statement on economic justice and income inequality prepared by our leadership council and available on our website. And in a concrete effort to put our faith and conviction into action, our annual convention urged all our congregations as well as the bishop's office to pay all lay employees an hourly livable wage appropriate for the state of Vermont. For me, the call to engage this challenge is grounded in the words Jesus used to summarize the commandments that informed his faith as well as the great Hebrew prophets before him and which is expressed this way in the gospel according to Matthew. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Borrowing from the teaching of Archbishop Rowan Williams in his book Faith in the Marketplace, we are reminded that maintaining wealth at the cost of our neighbor's disadvantage or worse is inhumane. What the other finds painful, I should find painful too. True love of neighbor is the moral and ethical imperative that can lead us from greed to generosity, from economic disparity to economic justice. Thank you, Senator. Bishop, thank you. Well, I too want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Senator Sanders for the tireless clarity of his leadership in addressing issues of income equality and particularly for championing the needs and rights of those who are so often disenfranchised by our nation's economic policies. This week I've spent most of my time in one of our local hospitals sitting with my spouse and this has given me an opportunity to observe the economy of an intensive care unit. There are skilled doctors, incredibly competent and caring nurses, a variety of aides and technicians, and oh yes, the woman who keep, kept my spouse's room spotlessly clean. Each and every one of these people added value and played an essential role in the excellent functioning of that unit. Each morning the cleaning person arrived and while she cleaned she asked Peg how she was feeling, performed small kindnesses, 
and found something in common to talk with her about. Over the days, we learned that she is a single parent, proud of her child who is excelling in school, and proud of her work at the hospital, work that enables her to sustain both of them. And I was also reminded of the stress that low-wage workers live with every day, knowing that financial security can be lost as easily as one illness, one fuel bill, or one car repair. As a Christian minister, my thinking and acting on economic issues is informed by three fundamental beliefs. I believe that we don't own the earth. The earth and all that is in it belongs to God and we are caretakers, not proprietary owners. In God's economy, every person on the face of the earth has equal worth and value and an inalienable right to abundance of life. And finally, it is our responsibility to order our economic life in such a way that it benefits the common good. That, to me, is a moral economy. The current and ever-widening income gap between those few at the top and the many at the bottom is neither moral nor just. The United Church of Christ, the denomination to which I belong, has a long history of advocating for economic justice and calling on both church and society to live out our moral obligations in our lives and in having just laws for all. A recent article by our Justice and Witness Ministries said the following, women in particular are hurt by stagnant low wages. Women comprise 47% of the overall workforce, but represent 76% of workers employed in the 10 largest low wage jobs. Working full-time year-round, the current federal minimum wage translates into an annual income of $14,500, a figure not high enough to cover even basic expenses. Rather than providing security and opportunity for full-time workers, the minimum wage is imposing <coughs> poverty upon millions of Americans. In the New Testament of the Bible, there is a letter that was written to the well-off members of one community to asking them to donate to the less well-off members of another community. The author writes, I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. It seems to me that a moral economy must be concerned with the fair balance for all. To settle for anything less is to fail to do the just and right thing, to fail to recognize and lift up the need and value of every person's contribution to the common good. Thank you very much. Um, Monsignor Ravadi is not going to be speaking, but before I introduce Rabbi uh, Chasen, let me just read one quote from the Pope. This is what the Pope said, and he has been very, very strong on all of these issues. He said, and I quote, the current financial crisis originated in a profound human crisis, the denial of the primacy of the human person. We have created new idols. The worship of the ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money, the idolatry of money, and the dictatorship of an impersonal economy lacking a truly human purpose. End of quote, uh, Pope Francis. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Rabbi Joshua Chasen, uh, senior rabbi at the Ohavi Zedek Synagogue here in Burlington. Rabbi. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for sharing your pulpit with us. 
<laughs> As the power of wealth in our country is concentrated in the hands of a very few, democracy is falling apart. The center is not holding. At stake is not only economics, but also our very capacity to be free. We are once again in a time that tries the soul of America. All people of faith and goodwill must come together at this time to confront the greed that already is shutting down the free give and take of democracy as well as diminishing the freedom of our electoral process. It is time again for us to forge a freedom movement in America. We must confront the greed with the question raised by the prophet Isaiah. What do you mean by crushing the people? By grinding the face of the poor? We must name the sin of perpetrating the impoverishment of the most vulnerable of us and the related sin of our standing idly by their hunger, their homelessness, and deepening poverty. Let us remember the wisdom that is our national inheritance. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Abraham Lincoln. Democracy will not come today, this year, nor ever through compromise and fear. Langston News. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Faith is taking the first step even when we don't see the whole staircase. Change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability but comes through continuous struggle, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. May the power of our collective conscience move us to do the hard work of rising above the fear that is bred by greed. May the words of the prophet Amos, off-cited by Dr. King, resonate in our souls. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let us take to heart Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel's comment on these words. One is uncertain of the exact meaning of this bold image, Rabbi Heschel wrote. It seems to combine several ideas a surging movement, a life-bringing substance, a dominant power, a mighty stream expressive of the vehemence of a never-ending, surging, fighting movement, as if obstacles had to be washed away for justice to be done. No rock is so hard that water cannot pierce it. Rabbi Heschel writes, citing words of Job, the mountain falls and crumbles away, the rock is removed from its place, the waters wear away the stones. Rabbi Heschel continues, justice is not a mere norm, but a fighting challenge, a restless drive. We are here this afternoon to 
to call upon all Americans of good faith to draw, join together in a restless drive to reclaim democracy in America by restoring power to the American people to define and shape our own lives. Once again, we must struggle and take the personal risks to create an America that lives up to the high social, economic, and political standards of our people's creed of freedom. Our deeds must once again reflect which so many struggled and gave the full measure of their lifeblood. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Well, I think you have heard some pretty powerful <coughs> testimony. Any questions? Media. What um, hold this together today? What, what did, all, did, did, did members of different faiths here get together in advance to want to bring this forward and have you hold this together as an event, or was, how did this well, all come we, about? We reached out. And was the people over here? Peter Galbraith is here. Peter, thank you for helping to organize it. You know, and I think there is just a common understanding that of the many, many problems facing our country, and there are many, there is none more serious and profound than this issue. And I think the religious community in Vermont throughout this country can and will play a very, very important role in bringing people together around this issue. And many of the people who are standing around us day in and day out, week in and week out, are working hard in Vermont around these issues of economic justice and income inequality. And we're very proud of their efforts. And there's a lot more like them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I happen to believe that all across the country, there is, I'm not gonna say everybody shares the same view, but the, I would say, overwhelming majority of people in our country shake their heads when they, as they understand that so few have so much and so many have so little, and the kinds of suffering that exists out there that is just kind of not talked about very often. Half of the people in this country have less than $10,000 in the bank. Half the people. That means they are in an automobile accident away, an illness away from financial disaster. Meanwhile, in recent years, there has been a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires. Most people in this country, regardless of their Religious views, their political views, do not think that that is what America should be. Yes? Um, can you update us, Senator, on what's going on in Congress now relative to this really important issue of the wealth gap? Well, the answer is... It <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first thing I could say is what you already know, not much is happening in Congress. Um, and there's a huge political division. And clearly it comes down, uh, you know, the parties are very much divided. Some of us are fighting for long-term, uh, an extension of long-term unemployment benefits. We are fighting to raise uh, the minimum wage to at least $10.10 an hour, and I'm proud that our state has gone uh, beyond that. Uh, some of us are fighting hard to create a federal jobs program, to create the millions of jobs that our people need. One of the issues that the Pope talks about often, and we don't talk about enough, is not just high unemployment, and real unemployment in America today is not 6.2%. Real unemployment is close to 12%. Youth unemployment is close to 20%. African American youth unemployment is close to 40%. So we need to create millions of jobs, and certainly the need is out there in terms of rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, moving to transform our energy system to weatherization and sustainable energy, we have the opportunity to create millions and millions of jobs. There is a strong political division in Congress between Republicans and Democrats and independents as to how we should go forward. And talking about that the divide, moving to the, the image that we see here today <coughs> with um, you know, the different religious leaders around the state of Vermont, uh, coming together over one issue, what sort of image does this send to the state and, and the country? I think, frankly, the image that it sends is that people 
of religious persuasion. Understand, and I am convinced it is not just in Vermont, it is throughout this country, that there is something profoundly wrong when the economic system of today creates a situation where some people have more wealth than you can imagine. I personally do not know, I really don't, what people do with $80 billion <laughs> or $140 billion in terms of the wealthiest family in America. How many homes do you need? How many automobiles do you need? How much food can you consume? How many boats can you have? I honestly don't know that. And I honestly believe, I think Joshua, uh, Rabbi Chasen, you know, emphasized the word greed. I think you're dealing almost with an illness where people are saying, it doesn't matter if I have five billion, I need 10 billion. And I don't care if children do not have enough to eat. I need more and more and more. And I think you're dealing with serious, to be honest with you, psychological problems. Everybody wants to do well in life. We all want enough for ourselves and our families. But people do not need tens of billions of dollars to survive. Yes, ma'am. Senator, will there be any um, practical steps coming out of this Specifically, as a result of this. Well, uh, I, th I think uh, Bishop Ely had some thoughts. Uh. We're, we're very much hoping that in uh, the Episcopal Church, on a church-wide basis, that our leadership can can convene some work around this issue, uh, drawing national faith leaders together. I know in Vermont, the Vermont uh, Interfaith Action uh, Group is working very hard at this issue, and they're probably one of the strongest uh, advocates that we have for getting action done on the ground here in Vermont. And so I look to them for some of their uh, effort. In our own Episcopal Church in Vermont, our Economic Justice Coalition, many of the members are here today, I have a feeling are gonna to continue to push uh, the bishop and uh, our diocese to uh, keep moving on this and to try to affect positive change. So. Did I speak the truth here? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. And I, I, I think you'll see in the coming months as we approach the next session of the General Assembly in Vermont that the Clergy Caucus of Vermont Interfaith Action, members of which are here today, will be bringing this message to Montpelier because this problem is, is a national problem but it doesn't stop at the borders of Vermont. And as the middle class crumbles, more and more people will be willing to speak out because their ox is getting gored. <laughs> and I think we, we are at the precipice, the, the good precipice, of, of a time when uh, social action distills out in a freedom movement in this country, including here in Vermont, that will bring us back to our senses. Just conclude by very sincerely uh, thanking the folks that are up here and thanking all of you for the work that you're doing every day. You know, in many ways, Vermont is trying to lead the country in different ways. And I think bringing the different religious groups together to stand up on this profound issue is enormously important. So thank you all very much.